here again with a fantastic conversation for you today. And you'll see a new face with us again. And this today is Rabbi Daniel Lapin. Good morning and welcome to the show. Hello, Rachel. And hello, Bruce. Good to be on the show with you today. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. So if you are listening, you may be wondering, why are we bringing a rabbi to talk about money on the Money Advantage podcast? So let me tell you, if you are in the position of wanting to make more money this year, that probably is one of your maybe New Year's resolutions, for instance, This would be a really good conversation to lean into and listen into. I know from reading Dr. Rabbi Daniel Lapin's book, Thou Shalt Prosper, there we go, that money and making money has a lot of philosophy and wisdom that has to come before the money is made. And that's really where we're going to focus in today. And so if you want to know a little bit more about who Rabbi Daniel Lapin is, he's an author, speaker, he's a TV host. He immigrated to the U.S. from South Africa after studying mathematics, physics, and economics in Israel and the U.K. He's written several books, and he's a frequent speaker. And I love as well, I don't know if we'll get into this today, but I love that you're an enthusiastic boater and that you have sailed across the Pacific in your own boat as well as homeschooled your seven children. Now, that all is enough to have a whole conversation on today. (laughs) Well, all all of that was uh, was easy to do because uh, I have an unusual wife who who went along with even some of my more flamboyant extravaganzas. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you for uh, attributing credit to her as well. I know that she probably had a huge part to do with that. So let's jump in today. You wrote a book specifically called Thou Shalt Prosper, 10 Commandments for Making Money. And I can tell you this is one of the deepest and most profound reads that I have ever had in the world of dealing with money. And I think a lot of times people will jump to what's the right financial product? What is, you know, how do I get a better return? How do I, um, what do I do right now? What's the tactical strategy that I do with my money? And those things are all extremely important, but before any products and before any strategy or before any tactics, we need a strategy. Before a strategy, you need the principles and the philosophy. And really today we're kind of deeping, deep diving all the way down to the foundations of what that philosophical underpinnings of truly making wealth is. So can you just tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got into um, the work that you do today? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not that interesting a backstory to tell you the truth. The, uh, uh, the book is much more interesting, but the backstory to the extent that it exists is simply that um, as I was uh, doing lectures around the country and I was speaking mostly uh, on socio-political topics, uh, people would come up to me and say, look, I have a question I want to ask you and please don't take offense. Um, so uh, I assure, I said, ask whatever you want. I am very unlikely to take offense. Uh, I may not like you and never speak to you again, but I'm not going to get angry at your question. That's fine. Um, so they, the question I got asked more than any other question is, um, how come Jews are so good with money? Mm. And people were really <laughs> uncomfortable asking me that question, to be honest. And I can yeah. sort of understand it because people have been conditioned to think that you better walk on eggshells when it comes to Jews because almost anything you say is going to be construed as anti-Semitic. Mm. And... Um, and frankly, you know, and people don't care for that very much. Sure. You know, what's wrong with a little open debate? And, uh, and that question in and of itself um, is, uh, is only offensive if you're going to imply that the reason that Jews are disproportionately good with money um, is because they constantly Jew people. The, Ox- mm-hmm. the old Oxford English Dictionary uh, lists one of the definitions of Jew as a verb as in to do somebody. So if you think Jews are successful uh, because of um, uh, the fact that they constantly rip off folks, uh, well, then we'd have to have a long conversation about that because I did look into the possibility of that being true. I really wanted to be honest about this. Mm -hmm. And in the opening pages of my book, Thou Shall Prosper, uh, you'll remember that I actually did analyze uh, several of the bogus explanations for Jewish financial wealth. But once the question got asked to me as often as it did, Uh, I realized that, um, well, I realized awkwardly that I actually did not have the answer readily Mm. to hand. And that was why I I looked at the 
explanations which I was subsequently able to debunk. For example, uh, the, the really stupid one that is so popular is the racist explanation, or racial, I should say, which is that um, um, Jews sort of pass a money gene along in their sperm to their children. And um, what happened is the Cossacks killed all the poor Jews, and so the rich ones were able to, you know, natural selection, Darwinian uh, theory at, at its best. But a lot of people believe that, and uh, mm -hmm. it, that obviously wasn't terribly difficult to debunk, and, and neither were any of the others. And so I was left having to do a, a massive research project of a number of years and interviewing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Oh, wow. Um, uh, Holocaust survivors who'd come to America as destroyed and traumatized young people uh, who then went on to build huge corporations like CVS pharmacies, for instance, oh, and, wow. uh, and uh, 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 Commodore computers and, and uh, uh, Chappelle Homes, a huge real estate development company in Southern California. And uh, I was able eventually to arrive at uh, a compellingly persuasive explanation of what was the cause. It's mm. not that there are no Jew, poor Jews, there are, but Nobody who hasn't just um, recently immigrated from outer Mongolia would deny that Jews are disproportionately good with money. Now, whenever I say this, um, Jews do get uncomfortable. <laughs> I give this I'm lecture sure. to, to Jewish audiences from time to time, and boy, they get so angry. And what their anger really boils down to is, uh, stop saying that. If, you, if we don't see, speak about it, maybe the Gentiles won't notice. Mm. Well, sure. you know, hello, note to Jews, everybody knows. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, this, is, this is not hard to figure out. Um, Forbes' list of the 400 richest Americans every year should contain uh, between six and seven uh, Jewish members because uh, Jews constitute about uh, a little over 2% of the American population at most. Um, the fact is that uh, the lowest that I've found in the last 30 years of publication, the lowest number I've found is 60 Jews on the Forbes 400 list. It's usually closer to 100. So mm. it's a massive overrepresentation by an order of magnitude. So, um, so yes, everybody knows. And the question is, you know, how do Jews do it? And, you know, is the That's secret circumcision? <laughs> yeah, in which case, I dare say many men would prefer poverty. But... Um, <laughs> But it isn't that. It's right. uh, fortunately, uh, it is the the vast catalog of uh, ancient Jewish wisdom embedded in the Hebrew scriptures um, that have been part and parcel of Jewish culture. Whether it's uh, among uh, dedicated sages who study the words diligently, or whether it's among secularized Jews who whose conversation at the dinner table revolves around it and the way they raise their families and inculcate their children uh, all reflect these intrinsic values. And so, you know, in a nutshell, that's what it was. And I worked uh, quite hard, as hard as I've ever worked in my life, to condense all of that into um, 10 fundamental principles that make up the 10, what I call the 10 commandments for making money. In the book, you were kind enough to demonstrate uh, thou shalt prosper, the Ten Commandments for making money. And then uh, I delved a little bit more deeply and ended up with uh, 40 uh, spiritual principles for financial abundance, which became my second book, Business Secrets from the Bible. So together, those two books do encapsulate everything I came up with and presented it in ways that uh, everybody can benefit from. That's just fascinating. Bruce, did you have something you want to share there? Uh, Rabbi, I, I, I concur with what, what you say with from my Jewish friends. I'm in, a, in several, um, I would say, business in incubators, investment clubs in the St. Louis area. And, um, you know, they talk about money throughout the family. And, and that's the biggest thing that I think has um, that holds a family back is not is not talking about uh, money. And I, I um you know, I think people, one of the commandments of Episcopalianism is thou shalt not talk about money in public. Yes. Probably. It, it, <laughs> or in private. <laughs> thou shalt not think about money, actually. That's probably even yeah. closer. But, but, the, but, the, but the thing, the, the one thing I really wanted to weigh in here um, on, it was it's not just about um, making the money. It's about being a good steward of the money and, and helping people with the money. 
And I think when you have a when you have that kind of principle behind you, uh, it, it frees you up to say, "Hey, I'm not just making this money for me, but I'm making it to better mankind in general." I and, couldn't uh, disagree with you more, Bruce. Oh, you, you can disagree with me more. Okay, well then let's let's this is good debate here because that that's I'm, the. That, I'm really what, sorry, but um, uh, but we we only have uh, a few minutes to talk today, and uh, and so if you if you don't mind. I'll dispense with the uh, with the polite concurrences and uh, and and sort of just dive right oh, into I, why we, I, we, I, we, I do not agree with you. We we love um, we love that yes. Now, um, something that not a lot of people know is that in the uh, uh, 17th century, many Jews became pirates. Now, oh, no, I didn't know that. No, no, very 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 few do. For me, it's wonderful knowledge, and that's why I've studied it, because if this rabbi thing doesn't work out for me, I love knowing there's an alternative career path. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I, I have to interrupt you right now. We just, somebody on Facebook, uh, one of our listeners just said, oh, by the way, I love this guy's sense of humor, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's not humor. This is all fab. I'm just telling you th things that are true. That's all. Uh, the, fa the fact that it. people find it funny is a tribute to your audience. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think he was referring to your sense of humor that you have something to to, to go back on if it doesn't work out. Uh, uh, but so, so let's hear about um, this. the pirates. The pirates were very interesting because um, the way piracy worked was that if you were moderately successful in your pillaging and plundering, and then at a certain point you wanted to retire and settle down and enter respectability. And the way you did that was uh, by dedicating or building a cathedral or a church or uh, a house a house for the, the governor on one of the Caribbean islands. And you will still see in, in Jamaica, for instance, uh, you will still see buildings that were built by former pirates to buy their way back into society. Mm. And I think it is incredibly um, dangerous for us to go along. I mean, here we are, are those who, who recognize the inherent dignity and morality of business and, and going along with this notion that we have to sort of buy our way back to respectability after pillaging and plundering. And the proof of what I'm saying is this. There is a phrase that I loathe and detest with every fiber in my being. And that is that uh, whenever the Bill Gateses of the world or anybody else makes a, a, a major philanthropic bequest or endows a hospital or whatever it is, I keep hearing the pundits talking heads on television, looking admiringly and saying, isn't it wonderful to see someone giving back to society? Now, that's a really, really bad phrase. Because if giving charity is giving back to society, what the hell were you doing to society while you were making the money in the first place? That means you were stealing from society. You, you were... must have been ripping off from society. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what people think business is. Because nobody ever, I've never seen anybody complain about the high fees and the high salaries paid to quarterbacks. Right. I've never heard anybody say the salaries in the NFL are too high. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we all look at that quarterback and we shake our heads and we say, man, I couldn't have run that play. I just couldn't. No way I could have done that. He's, he's special. But uh, when it comes to business, they don't understand what we do. And uh, you will, if you haven't already discovered it, you will discover that it is difficult to explain to your children what mommy or daddy does. You know, if it you are a difficult. fireman or mm -hmm. a policeman uh, or a pilot or a pirate, for that matter, um, what you do is so easy to explain. But what you do is not nearly as simple as you think. You know it, but... For your kid to understand it so he can tell the other kids what his mommy or daddy does, you're going to see this is really tough. And this is why people complain about CEO salaries, because they don't get what the guy in the corner office on the top floor actually does. And they simply do not understand that, for instance, when Lehman Brothers had their meltdown and they were banned from treasury auctions and essentially it was going to be a massive failure that was going to cost uh, the in entire investment community grievously, 
what happened is Warren Buffett, who Berkshire Hathaway had a holding in Lehman Brothers, and Warren Buffett took on the position of CEO for a dollar a year. What happened the day that was announced? Immediate turnaround. They were welcomed back to treasury auctions. The liquidity resolved itself. The run stopped. People don't understand that the CEO is the linchpin. Mm. He makes it work. That's why he gets the dollars. Mm -hmm. um, it's the confidence he brings. It's, it's the vision. Um, it's, it's making the decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody can say, well, I did what my accountant told me to do. You know, it's, it's, like, uh, uh, it's, it's like a president running a pandemic strictly on the basis of, well, I'm going to listen to the scientists. Well, then you're an idiot. <laughs> you have to hear what they say, but you don't follow any specialist. The whole point of a CEO and of a business professional is you're not a specialist. You listen to your legal people, you listen to your accounting people, you listen to your marketing people, and then you have to decide. Mm -hmm. And the decision you make is invariably going to be at odds with at least one of your specialists. Mm -hmm. And if it pays off, you're a great CEO, you did well. And if, you know, if there's a problem, you're probably going to be replaced pretty darn quick. So um, the life of a CEO is not that simple, but people don't get it. And that's why I, I'm not comfortable with the idea that we... Um, are, I have no interest in what you do. My focus is helping people increase their revenue. I really don't care what you do with it afterwards. I do care that you give 10% of it away because I don't believe we own 100% of what we make. I think I happen to believe I work for a boss who lets me work on a 90% commission, which I think is pretty good. 10% uh, doesn't belong to me. So no, no medals for giving 10% of your uh, income to charity. I mean, you, you, it's not yours. You have to do it. And uh, not doing it is robbery. So, um, but the idea that, uh, that we have to buy respectability by giving back to society, I categorically reject. You know, I really, I, and I apologize because I was a little distracted, Bruce, when you made your orig original um, comment that spurned that part of the conversation. But I know in the book, you talk about this idea that people think charity is benevolence and business is basically piracy stealing from other people and you kind of go through this whole thing about why i love you rachel giving value so few people actually read the book when when i get interviewed oh <laughs> well most of, we them, brought you on because most of them but they pay they looked at during the interview they're looking at the table of contents and they say your commandment number three states could you talk about that you know that's okay well, and I do some interviews like that, but in this case, I happen to have read the book. So, Bruce, um, did you want to make a point back to? Well, I, I first of all, uh, thanks. That was very enlightening to me. And part of my uh, my uh, my talking about my experience was exactly that. But the other part I was talking about in these incubators was this idea that these that they're sharing ideas to other business owners. And th that actually uh, obviously comes back to them because then a lot of times they come back to them for resources and so on and so forth, but they feel like, hey, I I'm successful. So I'm helping society by teaching them how to do business properly. So uh, yeah, part of it was the money give back, but a lot of it was actually um, the give back to society as far as you know, helping to grow businesses. And obviously that is a, is a thing that helps society. I don't Almost know. It's like they, investing the wisdom that you've gained by the success that you've correct. earned. And, so I don't know. And there, I, I could hardly agree with you more. And it bothers me okay. intensely that so many uh, people of, of my religion uh, are dedicated to the, the politics of socialism, mm. whereby somehow uh, the way to help people is by government handouts. Why, you know, why don't Jews start Jewish institutes of entrepreneurial activity for underprivileged people? But instead, you know, anyone would think Jews have achieved their position of financial prominence uh, by incremental increases in the minimum wage. No, that's not mm. how Jews did well. They, they right. did well by, by being in business. And, and that's what we should be teaching other people instead of focusing on ways to increase welfare payments. Absolutely. You could not have hit the nail on the head any better. Let's actually go into a few of the things. And specifically right now, I would love for you to talk about the one idea where you brought out in the book that Jews really went into banking and not as like this industry was the one industry that everyone else ran away from. So it was the last resort. They had to go into banking. 
why did Jews go into banking and how did that help their prominence and their success? Um, so the, uh, the, 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 what happened there is rather interesting and, and it's difficult for people in our culture today to understand the significant role that the Bible has played in civilization up to the present time. Right now, uh, we are living literally in the first um, period that, I, and I mean, I've looked at, at, you know, from early medieval times to the present. Uh, this is truly the first generation in, in the history of many hundreds of years, close to a millennium, uh, where you can be considered to be an educated human being. You can even be considered an influential human being, and yet you simply do not know whether Leviticus is a book or a man's aftershave lotion. <laughs> sure. And this wasn't always the case. Uh, people understood the role that the Bible played in thinking. Um, so much so that the American Constitution and our entire legal framework uh, was based by the founders largely on the work of the English jurist John Locke. Mm -hmm. And if you speak to a, a, either of your lawyers? No, we sorry, are not. No. Uh, if you speak to lawyers and you say, well, you remember get, being in law school, right? Yeah. Uh, do you remember studying John Locke in law? Yeah, of course. You, you can't possibly get through law school without studying John Locke. He provided the origin of the American legal system. And then mm -hmm. you say, well, did you study his treatise number two or treatise number one or both? And they'll always say, well, I never knew he, he wrote two. We just studied the treatise of John Locke. Yeah, you studied number two. Mm. Uh, law schools today didn't used to be this way. Used to be, they used to teach them both. But today they only teach number two. John Locke's first treatise is showing how civil law is ex extracted from the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. That's oh, what really? he does. And then in uh, treatise two, he then expands on these principles to create the entire matrix of law as we know it. So people study that one in law school, but today universities won't allow students to study treatise number one that links it to the Bible. I tell you all this in order to make sense of the fact that um, it was quite common years ago uh, for serious Christian businessmen to say, look, the Bible prohibits interest, so we can't do banking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do say that, or that's why you shouldn't charge someone, or that's why you shouldn't... Right. Why, we, why you shouldn't borrow. I mean, that argument has gone as far as to say why you should never be in debt because yeah, interest exactly. is exactly. Yeah. And so uh, what, uh, what happened is that ancient Jewish wisdom that is, is based on the uh, material that is embedded within the Hebrew language text of the Bible um, elaborate upon a lot of things. So just to give you an example, um, it says that... Uh, you're not allowed to put a stumbling block before blind men, right? Something it says in the five books of Moses. Now, this would suggest that my favorite occupation of tripping up little old ladies who wear dark glasses and walk with white sticks in front of them, I'm not allowed to do that, you know, which is preposterous. Right. I mean, you know, how can a book that has in it the 10th commandment that says, not only am I not allowed to steal things that belong to you, I must not even allow my heart to desire them. I have to suppress that emotion. But you know what? Up till yesterday, tripping up old blind people was okay. You're not allowed to do it today. So ancient Jewish wisdom um, explains that that is the way uh, it teaches and explains that you're not allowed to exploit a lack of information in a business transaction that isn't transparent. Ooh, and so I am actually profound. prohibited yes. uh, from offering you a price for your property without disclosing to you that I'm aware that uh, there's a planned development or, or uh, uh, infrastructure that is going to be built there that is going to increase the value of your property. I am not allowed to make you an offer for it without disclosing that information. That's called tripping up a blind person. Interesting. And so in, in exactly the same way, the section on interest, number one, distinguishes between a loan that is a desperation loan to help a friend out of a hole 
And um, on the other hand, uh, an equity loan or a, um, a debt loan for the developing and growth of a business. Interesting, yes. And okay. so because, because we see the Bible as God's declaration of the necessity for human connection, and that's why a very cheerful deity who, who makes one place after another, uh, he, he makes whatever God makes in the beginning of Genesis, he ends up saying that's good. I mean, even Fresno, for God's sake, uh, everything he made is good. You Which know, actually so, was really interesting in reading your book. I had not realized that there's a, a verse in, I think it's Genesis 2, where it said that in the, uh, the land where gold is very good. And gold the, is one good. of the reasons that gold is the metal of monetization rather than, shall we say, platinum. Uh, gold possesses no intrinsic advantages over platinum. It's just that from time immemorial, people read that God said gold is good go for it. It's, you know, gold becomes the monetization metal. That was the eighth time God says good. The very first time he ever says not good um, is for people to be alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, when God says not good for man to be alone, uh, again, a lot of people assume this refers exclusively to Adam and Eve's matrimonial prospects. But it isn't. It's a general statement. It's a universal principle. It's not good for people to be um, alone in, in any way at all. And this is why uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in uh, one of his books, points out something that uh, had been an established economic principle before then, which is the most reliable correlation of financially successful people is they know a lot of people. They have a lot of friends, mm -hmm. not Facebook friends, real friends. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is because essentially God says, and again, I'm, you know, I'm sharing with you ancient Jewish wisdom on this. I'm not saying everybody necessarily agrees, but the evidence mm -hmm. of how it has impacted the financial fortunes of the Jewish people um, for, for many, many, many periods in many different places, I think suggests that there's something uh, to bear in mind and something of value here, which is that um, God's position is, I want you to connect with one another. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you two ways to do it. And both are really pleasurable. The first way is sex, and the second way is money. And so build families, right, because that's what sex actually is. It's, you know, you're here, and you get together on Thanksgiving with uncles and aunts and cousins and nieces and nephews, really because grandpa and grandma spotted each other across a room many, many years ago. Their, their eyes glinted, and they found ecstasy in one another's arms, and away they went. And the family is here for that reason. That pleases the good Lord. And the second way, well, how do you interact with people where it's not a family relation? Well, simple. For that, we use money. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people say money doesn't make you happy. And, um, uh, you know, that is, um, that, that's a mistake. It's like saying a car doesn't drive you anywhere. Well, yeah, it doesn't. That's true. You've got to put gasoline in it. You've got to put a driver behind the wheel. But, yes, with those provisos, a car absolutely does get you places. There are certain provisos with respect to money as well. And with those provisos in place, money makes you very, very happy. And uh, the, the chief and most important of those provisos is you have to earn it yourself. And I think we all know what happens to families who uh, win the lottery. I do. Yes, I literally exactly. do not know. And I've studied this. And you know, and it, you may you may have contradictory information. I do not know of a single instance of people who won the lottery and two years later were happier and better off for it. I have uh, not so seen get, anything. <laughs> getting money, and interesting enough, English and Hebrew are one of the few languages in which there's a distinction between winning money and earning money. Mm, interesting. Uh, Hebrew Can you show that? and English both distinguish, but Spanish, French, Italian, most other, most of the Romance languages that I'm aware of use the you know ganari dinero, you know, just getting money. It's just the same thing. There is no, there is no distinction, and that may even have something to do with why the. It has a little bit to do, I would guess, with uh, this is just a speculation. Why the, um, why the uh, industrial revolution in the middle 18th century launched in England and not say in Germany and or, or some other places which mechanically and educationally were at least the equal of, of the United Kingdom. So these things are really important. And the, um, the, the connection, the idea of connecting with one another through money and having friends and having lots of contacts, 
um, very important. So God really says, look, I'm, I'm going to reward you if you connect effectively. And you know what, um, I just thought it, it was, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, sorry. I'm talking too much. It's okay. No, I, I love the, there were so many profound principles in the book. And one specifically, as you were mentioning that in the Bible, it doesn't say that you should never charge interest. It says that you shouldn't charge interest. You're not allowed to exploit the lack of information that somebody else has. So you just shared that. But what was really interesting is that a lot of Jewish people ended up going into banking and understanding banking, understanding how it works, understanding how to provide loans for commerce and for industry and charging interest as a result of that and expanding what was good for everyone. And by understanding the banking process, I mean, that in itself then allows a whole people group to understand how money works in a much more yes. profound way than if you're advancing says, money you're advancing money to somebody because he wants to um expand his business and buy inventory or put up another building or whatever it is uh, that lending isn't governed by the laws of interest and here's how it's dealt with you see as part of god's love of connection he prefers equity to debt you see when I owe money to somebody, I usually cross the street to avoid running into him. It's awkward. Mm -hmm. But when I have an equity investor in my business, I seek him out because he has an interest. His interests and my interests are aligned and he may have advice for me and I'll go and talk to him. So equity investors are, are wonderful things. I think God smiles on those. Debt is a little different. So what we do is uh, we do a very sophisticated economic transaction which in effect converts debt to equity and um, and so the interest payment is less an interest payment than it is a, uh, a distribution of profit in a sense oh, I love so, that. Uh, and so Jews were able to become bankers but I think the most important thing in in that whole banking story is that um, in order to bank, to, to be in banking, in order to be in business in general, but particularly in banking, you've got to understand the nature of money. And the huge uh, takeaway here, and it's, it's in the book and it's in reality, and uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't really need me to tell you this, but a lot of people are, are not um, really aware of it, is that uh, money is in essence a spiritual commodity not a tangible or physical one can you explain and that that's, that's profound it's hugely significant and um and so you know people sometimes ask me well what's the most important thing you'd say to somebody starting a business and i'd say well uh, i think the most important thing is that there is no one important thing um because business and life are far too complex to be operated on the basis of a silly slogan Mm. Uh, these are, are profound and, uh, and consequential principles that you need to wrap your entire being around. Um, and one of them, for instance, is that if you consider business to be a reprehensible activity, and most people do, even the babysitter I hired two weeks ago, when we came home, um, I asked her, how much do we owe you? And she, her eyes looked down and she started tracing patterns in the carpet with her toe. And she said, uh, would $25 be okay? And I said, no, it actually wouldn't. And she was shocked. And I know she was about to lower it. And I said, uh, but $35 would be okay. And she couldn't understand. I said, look, you did a great job. And I want to be able to call you again. And next time I call you, I want you to be eager to come and, and work here. So you know, don't be embarrassed about setting your price. If you're good at what you do, the market will pay it. And, and if they don't, it's a good sign that you're trying to overcharge. That's all. Let the market decide. And, and, and people are like that. They, they believe that in earning their money, they're taking it, not making it. Um, and the general rule is that uh, nobody can ever succeed at any activity that deep down they consider to be morally reprehensible. And, and that's why it is. It was one of the subtle points from, do you remember the old show, The Honeymooners? It's from 100 years ago. Um, I haven't seen Ralph, it. Ralph Cramden and Ed. And um, you remember Bruce, what Ed's profession was? You're good. It's, it's a profession. Uh, was it one a, a postal 
postal person? No, what? he was a sanitary engineer. Oh, he worked right. in that's the right. sewers. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But he didn't say I'm a sewerage worker. <laughs> he said I'm a sanitary engineer. <laughs> because, because we all need to, and, and again, I mean, uh, pornographers depict themselves as champions of the First Amendment. Everybody has to um, portray themselves as, as doing something worthwhile for human beings. And, uh, and if you don't, and so if you believe that your business is actually um, stealing money from gullible customers who, who don't realize what you're doing, you're never going to be particularly good at it. And so, you know, that's, that's a hugely important principle, obviously. And again, understanding the, the spirituality of money. And, and what I mean by that is not, I'm not talking God or religion. When I say spirituality, I'm strictly speaking in lab terms. Physical commodities can be measured in a laboratory. Spiritual commodities cannot. And so physical commodities on a human being are like skin color, weight, height, um, how much hair you've got, or et cetera. Um, spiritual qualities are, um, are integrity, uh, articulateness, um, uh, optimism, resourcefulness, the ability. I don't know if I lost you. Bruce, can you still hear? No. Can you hear me? About the physical characteristics. Oh, okay. You're back. We only care about the spiritual ones. Yes, I love that you talk about it being spiritual as opposed to just physical because there's so much that happens behind making money. It involves the relationships that you have with people. You talked about the friendship requirement, the giving of value which is a profound idea in itself. And actually there's a couple of ideas that I pulled out of the book as I was just kind of re um, looking at everything again yesterday. One, I would love you to comment on the idea of Cain in the Bible, Cain killing Abel and how he thought that was going to be uh, knocking out his competition so he'd be successful when in fact it ended up being the opposite. Um, so can you comment on that real quick? Um Yes, I can. Real quick is always my <laughs> That's okay. weak point. But <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But uh, hey, I am a rabbi. And um, so, um, right. So what, what Cain did was perfectly logical and perfectly normal. And for those people who are Bible enthusiasts, it's worthwhile to actually go back and look at the verses and discover that... Um, there's a sort of incomplete sentence there where it says, uh, and Cain said to, uh, to Abel in the field, you know, they were talking, but it doesn't tell us what they were talking about. And again, ancient Jewish wisdom drawing on the uh, subtext uh, encrypted into the Hebrew characters uh, points out that uh, it was obvious what they were talking about. And the Bible never tells you things that are obvious. What they were talking about was Cain said to Abel, um, you know, Father Adam is getting old, and uh, we, you and I are his only offspring. We have to decide who inherits the world. And um, Cain said, so here's what I've decided. Uh, you can have the spiritual reality. I'll take the physical reality. And if you want to live on anywhere, on any land, you just have to pay me rent, and, um, and that's how it'll work. And Abel said, you know, absolutely not. That's out of the question. Um, as a matter of fact, we are going to share equally. I'm going to take half the land. You're going to take the, half the land. And what's more, I'm getting British Columbia. Uh, uh, that part I just put in myself. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I love British Columbia. Um, love but uh, Cain then... And, and one of the things we have to know is that Cain's name in Hebrew, in Hebrew, every name has a meaning. There are no names in Hebrew like Fred or Agatha. Uh, every name has a meaning. And Cain's name means I live to acquire stuff. Interesting. You know, so he sees reality in tangible physical things. And so obviously, if your entire being, even your name, is uh, based on acquisition, and somebody, your brother be it, is about to take away from you half the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to kill him, don't you? And he, 
Yeah. And the interesting thing is the, um, the subsequent punishments. Um, again, people are people who are interested in the Bible know that God's response to the punishment was, you're going to have to be a wanderer. You're never, for the rest of your life, you're not going to be able to be in one place. People don't note that that's only part of the punishment. The second part of it is that uh, nothing you plant will ever grow. And the reason for all of that is God is trying to teach a lesson to, Adam, to Cain, which is your wealth is not the stuff you own, it's other people. Mm-hmm. In other words, even you and I can ask ourselves, what is our money worth, right? We've all got assets. You've got a net worth. What happens to it if you discover you're the last person on earth? Everyone else has vanished. And you think to yourself, well, I'm even richer now because I even own all the cars left ownerless parked on the street. And I own all the real estate. And the problem arises when you want to have dinner that night and you discover no restaurants are open. Mm-hmm. And you have to depend on what's in your pantry. Tomorrow you go and scrounge all the supermarkets because they belong to you as well. And then eventually the cans of food in the supermarket start bulging and all the produce has gone rotten. And you realize that with all your net worth, you are actually reduced to living like a subsistence peasant, planting some corn and praying to God that it grows before you'd starve to death. Mm -hmm. And so God's saying to Cain, your wealth is other people. Back to the Gladwell point of uh, how many friends do you have? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, And so God says to Cain, look, you thought your wealth was in land. It's nice to own some land, but the idea that that's the measure of your wealth. No, the measure of your wealth are your contacts, your community, uh, the people you're connected with. And so I'm going to teach you that it's not the land because land is good for only two things, agriculture and development. There's nothing else to do with land. You either grow stuff or build stuff. Mm -hmm. And so forget about building because you're going to keep traveling. You may never settle anywhere long enough to collect any rent. So forget about building. And number two, forget about agriculture because you're going to have to keep moving and nothing you plant will ever grow. And so Adam says, well, then, you know, what am I supposed to do? God says, you have to figure out where your wealth lies. And here comes the zinger. I bet you don't remember the very next thing that Adam, that Cain did. I, I do a little bit from, from your book, but I'll let you know. Ah, it. <laughs> all right. Well, it's more interesting when you read it in the big book itself, because uh-huh. there, the, the next thing Cain does is he has a child. Mm-hmm. With who? Who cares? That's irrelevant. From a spiritual point of view, all that matters is that Cain realizes that other people are vital for your life. They're not a, then they they are not competitors. They don't take away your wealth; they add to it. So mm-hmm. he brings a child into the world. The next thing he does is he builds a city, for who? Like five people on the planet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because cities produce affluence. Affluence doesn't produce cities. It goes the other way around. That's why people leave rural areas and move to the cities always because that's where you make money. Somebody wants to open up a jewelry store and tells me he's opening it in Death Valley, California, because there's no competition. You know, I tell him he's an idiot. He must open it on 47th Street in Manhattan where all the other jewelers are. And that's Mm -hmm. why industries cluster in whatever city you live in. There's going to be a furniture area. There'll be a jewelry area. There'll be a fabric and textile area, clothing area. Businesses cluster for that very reason. Our wealth is other people. This is just really, really cool. And I love the idea that money is not just about money. Just pursuing money will never get you there. And Oh, yeah, right. There that's are, important. <laughs> there are principles behind making money. And I think that's why I love your book so much. I know we're really running close towards the end of the show here. Um, but why do you think most people associate making money with greed and all the negative connotations. Why do they think of rich people as bad and taking away from the rest of the world? Where does that come from? And really, how do we solve this? I'm guessing it starts with us, not with fixing all of society, but where do we start to solve this? I think it's, it's a really good question. And, uh, and I've got my eye on the clock, so um, rest assured that although I uh, keep talking, I, I am aware of the, the limitations here, and I am tremendously uh, dismayed and perplexed by them, I'll tell you, um, given, given the topic. 
Uh, I think it's important to note that it wasn't always like this, Rachel. Uh, there was a time when we celebrated wealth. Um, do you remember the books that mothers used to give their boys to read? It was a whole series of books called the uh, Horatio Alger books. Mm, yeah. And you can still find them in the rare secondhand bookstore. Uh, they're a lot more expensive now than they used to be, but we got them for our kids because the notion that um, mothers and fathers are going to educate their children to understand the value of somebody pulling himself up by his bootstraps and becoming a successful and wealthy person, today, that is all, it's gone. Today, as you correctly put it, um, the so-called rich person, the financially successful person, is dismissed as a blight on the face of society. Listen to politicians saying the rich must pay their fair share. What on earth do you think they've been paying up till now? What does that mean anyway? I, I, I said this that gets in my crawl too, Rabbi. Because uh, what what's the definition of fair share? It's it's somebody. Oh, you're who, so right on that. There is no definition of fair. That's if you want to say equal, then say equal. But when you use the word fair, it appeals to people who are not thinking it through. And then mm -hmm. the rich. Well, that's never you and me, right? So let's vote for that guy because he's going to sock it to those other people. And you poor deluded fool, you don't realize that he's coming for you next. <laughs> And so it didn't used to be this way. And you know what's also funny? And um, I, you know, I, I share the, the, uh, the gag reflex when people say, oh, you know, the, the rich must pay their fair share. But uh, what will make you laugh, Bruce, is listening to politicians competing with one another to explain their backstories of how poor they all grew up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that a single politician ever grew up in any middle-class comfort, right? They all grew up poor. Oh, of course. Right? Don't you believe it? It's all lies. But they have, they've so successfully conditioned the voters to believe that poor is good and rich is bad that today there's not even an equal justice system. Seattle is just trying to pass a law that people below a certain income do not get prosecuted for crimes. Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. We do, so we, we're, we're living in a time now... Yeah, poor is venerated, rich is not. And I think one of the reasons for that is that if you're trying to, I mean, I don't want to be paranoid here, but if you're trying to build up a government tyranny, if you're trying to build up an all-powerful state, you don't want independent citizens. You want citizens who are poor and dependent because that then they will the vote you into power every single election. And one of the two ways that people obtain independence are through family and money. If my family is my first recourse and I'm independently successful, I don't need the government. And that's one of the reasons that throughout history, uh, socialist-leaning tyrannies have always made war on the traditional family and on independent uh, ownership of property. Mm. And so uh, to answer your question, it's not that it's always been this way. It's become that way recently. Um, originally, people understood this fundamental principle. And, and maybe, maybe the best way I can do this is um, look at the clock, Rachel, and tell me, can I do three minutes of an explanation? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay, fine. Uh, <coughs> because I could have dropped this as well, but I think it's helpful. Um, it's a little bit of a basic uh, bookkeeping. And uh, nobody should turn off. You should, uh, you should follow avidly at this point. This is fun for everybody. And I know many people go sort of develop a blind spot when it comes to algebra or mathematics or bookkeeping or arithmetic. This is a story. This is me walking into a shop, a shoe store, because I'm desperately eager to buy a pair of sneakers with red lights in the heel that flash when you walk. And... Um, I go in and it's great because the storekeeper sits me down in a chair, goes down on his knees in front of me, not as a symbol of, of um, subservience or of menial uh, activity, but because of something called customer service, which mm -hmm. is only one step away from what I think of as a worship service. Because mm -hmm. one way of pleasing a father is by satisfying and making his children happy. And I don't think our father in heaven is any different. I think that when he sees us helping one another, he smiles. And the place where that happens is called a store. 
and so he uh, takes off my shoes, puts on a pair of sneakers. I walk around, stand in front of the mirror, red lights flashing like crazy. I'm as happy as could be. And I say, I want them, uh, put them in a box, wrap them up. I'm going, he says, that'll be $20. I give him $20 and I walk out of the store. Now we need to engage in a little thought experiment to see what has happened to my financial statement. And the way we'll do this is we'll imagine you coming up to me and saying, hey, Lap, and I saw you just got this pair of sneakers with red lights in the heels. Would you sell them to me for $20? What's my response? Absolutely not. I love my shoes, right? Yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> I, I, I found the store. I've just sat down. I've, I, I took the, why would I do that? Get out of here. He says, okay, wait, 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 wait. Just give me a moment. How about if I gave you $30? Would you do them, take them for $30? And I think to myself, well, you know, I know that's a $10 profit, but I've got to go find another store. This was the last pair in my size here. I said, no, nah, you know what? I'm sorry. Notice that I've now already valued my increase in my financial statement by $10. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not necessarily what we would consider gap accounting principles, right? Generally accepted accounting doesn't work this way, but that doesn't mean it's right. That's only set in place because the SEC wanted some uniform way of evaluating things and dealing with potential uh, skullduggery. But in reality, this is my financial statement. And the guy says, $30. I said, no, you know what? Not going to. He says, okay, $40. Now, Mrs. Lappin didn't raise any dummies. And I'm thinking to myself, double my money, you know, in, in half an hour. Uh, I, this, this may make sense. And I said to him, you know, he, he offered 40, he'll probably go 45. And I said to him, I'll sell him to you for 45. And I have just established what has happened to my net worth. I've proven it. Mm -hmm. I will give these to you for $45. That tells you what they're worth to me. Simple mm -hmm. as it. So now let's take a look and see what this human transaction has done to this microcosm or this microeconomic cosm of storekeeper and Lappin. Uh, let us say for the moment that the, um, you know, that the margin on merchandise in the shoe store is 100%. Let's say that those shoes cost him from the wholesaler $10. And they were on his books as $10. Now he, because I came and uh, sat down in his chair, he's replaced a $10 asset with $20. So mm -hmm. he's up $10. I replaced $20 with $45. So I'm up $25, 25 with me and 10 with him. We have increased the worth. We've increased the wealth in just this tiny little microcosm of the shopping mall by $35. Now, what should happen, of course, is that the government should now immediately print $35 worth of currency. But they don't. They print $300 worth of currency, yes. thereby devaluing our currency. Yes. But... Um, this is how wealth is created. It's when one human being serves another, either with goods or what we call service. And uh, it's as simple as that. That's what produces wealth. And that's why it is that when the storekeeper makes money, he doesn't have to apologize to society. He's already pleased society by making shoes available to the likes of me. I'm happy he's there. That's the, the summary of it. I love Very it. Good. I love it. Bruce, you can, do you want to go, do you have anything you want to share here? No, uh, Rabbi, uh, I just would like to say that uh, thank you for coming on uh, today because uh, these are the things I think we need to talk about more um, out into the community so that uh, the wisdom is passed along uh, from a different viewpoint. And um, I would love it in, in the next uh, quarter or maybe uh, six months from now, if, if we could bring you on and just kind of, uh, talk about many more of your <clears throat> commandments, because I think it would uh, not only help our listeners, but then just like you were talking about, then our listeners would actually then talk about your wisdom and it would just keep going out and out in like waves into, uh, in, into our. No, I promise yeah. you, uh, 
anybody who reads my book before an interview, you're never going to have to twist my arm to come back. So count on it. Nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's just even so much more that we could expound upon. And Bruce, thank you for that lovely invitation, because I, I would love to continue the conversation. Let's go I'll ahead. Just say, I'll just go say ahead. this in closing, and that is that um, people who've got their children in public school, find out if your children are ever taught anything about money anything about budgeting, anything about wealth creation, the answer I can tell you already is no. It's a tragedy. Yes. And you know, what's so interesting is that I think that that responsibility comes back to the home, which then if you say, okay, I want to help my children learn how to create wealth, that implies and necessitates I am going to take the responsibility to create wealth myself if I'm going to transfer a skill set to my children, which then is a huge undertaking to say, okay, well now that I have not necessarily learned this from my upbringing and I haven't learned it from my schooling, how do I take control? How do I become self-educated? How do I become that continual learner to say, I need to figure out how to be myself, how to provide value in this world, how to serve others, how to build a network, how to provide value to the world so that I can. And that's exactly what your business up. does. That's what you guys do so effectively. And, and your clients are blessed. They really are. Oh, well, uh, may you. I give my website? Yes. I was actually just going to ask you for that next. I have provided on Facebook and YouTube, the link to get your book, but I really would love for anyone to, for you to share yeah, how people they can who get wanna, in touch with People who want to reach me or, or talk to me. Yes. Uh, it's rabbidaniellappin.com. Rabbidaniellappin.com. But um, for people who, uh, who don't want to remember the rabbi Daniel Lappin.com, you can also use the URL just you need a rabbi.com. That's very good. And I'm going to put both into Facebook and YouTube so that. Fabulous. So that we will have that. And is there any better way to get your book? I provided the Amazon link. Um, can they get that through your website as well? And um, they can also get it on my website with pleasure. And they're also. Um, video and uh, audio lesson accompaniments available on the website that uh, fill in little gaps here and then that make the thing easier to absorb. Wonderful. And um, so also you had mentioned another book that had 40 principles. What is the name uh, of that It's book? called Business Secrets from the Bible. Okay. And I'm assuming that's also available on your website, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. I will put the name of that here. All right, so there you have it, friends. We are looking at truly gaining wisdom, not just figuring out what to do with our money that we've already made because creating it in the first place is half of the battle. So I wanna make sure that you are using wisdom like today, what we have talked about with, uh, with I keep wanting to call you doctor, with Rabbi Daniel. Look, Lincoln. I'm gonna insist you call me Bishop if you keep that up. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Rabbi. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show today, for just sharing your wisdom, for, sh for coming and showing up filled up for being in a position of really just giving of the knowledge and wisdom that you've accumulated and assimilated through your lifetime. It's a, and it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank and you. I'll just say it's not my wisdom, it's his. Excellent. And I really, really appreciate that. So friends, if you are listening, go ahead and go to you need a rabbi.com or rabbi Daniel The links are in the show notes. If you're listening to the podcast later on, we'll have those links as well on the show notes for you. And please remember, as we're talking about building and creating wealth, if you are in a position where you're saying, I realize now all of the wisdom that I need to create wealth in the first place, let me figure out now how to use that wealth to create more. We'd love to talk to you. You can book a, a call with us on our website. That's themoneyadvantage.com. You can go straight to our advisor calendar. And just remember as well, we're always here providing you resources to know how to maximize and optimize the wealth that you have. So in closing, remember success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd and build a life and business you love. <laughs>